Hi, I'm Weekly Shonen. I know One Piece is on break, but I'm still excited for this week's review because we have two really awesome chapters to cover. And, you know, I also saw Jujutsu Kaisen Zero this weekend, so I'll be talking about my experience with that as well at the end. So let's jump right into it and start with My Hero 348. It only seems fitting to start with My Hero because it did make the cover this week. And gotta say, I like the cover a lot. Usually Shonen covers are like jumbled, you know, really compact and, you know, a bunch of characters inside of them. So when I get like cool sleek designs like this that still have all the information necessary, but just laid out nicely like this, it's uh, it feels kind of empty, but you know, like a, like a real portrait sort of. I like that, I really do like that. And you know, it's really fitting considering this chapter was about Deku and Ochako kind of splitting apart and you have Ochako staring off into her objective while Deku's facing us. So really fitting again. So I really liked it. The fan translation this week kind of made it out to seem like Deku was maidenless, but the Viz translation went a little bit softer on him. Scratch that. Toga's confession here in the beginning is revealed to be sort of based on her first crush. Some unnamed boy who just happens to look like Deku who's also covered in blood. And maybe that's part of the resemblance, but if you look at the panels here, they really do look alike. I'm pretty sure that's new information, but you know, I could always be wrong. I have only started reading the manga since like my villain anyway, so. Never know. Either way, I hope we get more of that throughout this fight. I don't know, I'm just kind of wondering if the blood is due to her or a fight that he was in. You know, I, I want to get more context on that specific first crush scene there. Togi gives a really creepy, or should I say, crepey face here, which uh, I don't know why, but it kind of reminds me of him from Powerpuff Girls. She says she wants to be Deku and Deku's response here is priceless because He's like asking for clarification while also listing date ideas and Ochako, while you know he's doing that is just on the side looking all serious and you can just tell that in her mind she's just like yeah right right that's a that's a great those are some great ideas i'd really love that toga then goes to explain herself saying that you know her love is the reason she wants to be deku and it's the only thing that'll make her satisfied which again noted like just just keep note of these little things then she asked deku something similar that uh you know to what she asked ochako in their last fight which is what do you want to do to me now like knowing this what is your next move deku kind of plays it right here he kind of reveals that you know this is similar to how he views all might but not really but just like hey i can understand wanting to be someone else or wanting to be like someone else now deku also reveals that Danger Sense is not being picked up. And so he's at a disadvantage, which is kind of weird to me because I would think since he has all this fighting experience and since he's like one of the fastest people in the series, that should be no problem with him, especially, you know, with a, an opponent who's out in the open. But, you know, I, I guess he has a lot to work on. I guess there's like, you know, that just goes to show that all of his quirks are kind of just making up for each, like each of the, uh, the weaknesses of the other quirks. So when you pull one out, he's kind of like at a disadvantage, but still very, very weird. Or like, you know, just maybe that's a small line that's supposed to come into play later on. I'm not too sure. It's also confirmed that um, the reason why Danger Sense is not activating is not because Toga is secretly an ally who's here to, you know, help them out depending on Deku's answer. It's that, well, She's just really good at masking her presence, which again, noted, keep note for later. Toga's response here is pure deflection though. She kind of mashes what Deku's saying together with what she heard from her parents growing up. And all Deku's really saying is, my idea of love does not match with your idea. Not that you should subscribe to my channel. If you are not subscribed yet, please do. It helps the channel a lot. And I'm about 20 subs away from getting to 100 subscribers. When that happens, I don't know what the hell I'm gonna do. I'm still gonna be making any other types of videos. Like this, this week, Platinum Man is over. I'll get, I'll get whatever. But yeah, subscribe. My ideology. What the, what the hell was that? Either way, Toga set off, and you know, just before lashing out at everything, and just like, hey, the world rejected me, so I'm gonna reject the world now. She kind of gives us a glimpse into just how sad she is. Not just sad, like as a as an insult, but just like you can legit see the sadness in her eyes and there's a comment on that. She also goes on to say like heroes are the only people who count as people or that that's what the heroes think, which again, no one's saying that, you know, even Ochako during her last fight was like, not really saying you can't live how you want, but just no matter how you do live, you have to be prepared to live with those consequences. And, you know, if there's anything that she does have on point, it's the fact that people like her and people like Ochako and Deku are never, you know, are destined to be apart, which of course makes sense. That being said, Ochako now tries to step in and relate to Toga, but it's too late because <laughs> Toga's already broken up with Deku and this whole idea of Deku and Ochako are like being able to relate to them. So now the whole, the world rejected me, so I'm gonna reject the world bit is kind of weird because, you know, it's hard for me to tell if she means that Deku is her world slash representation for her world, or, you know, just the world itself has rejected her because 
I want to say it's the latter, but the fact that he does look exactly like her first crush makes me feel like, you know, she could also just be projecting this onto him anyway. And, you know, since th this is all in her head and she's a little messed up person, it, you know, it's, it's, it's very possible that, you know, certain parts and certain memories are getting jambled together for her to create this ideal, you know, not ideology, but just like, that, that it personifies into what she kind of, you know, projects outward. Is that right phrasing? This is why I'm not trying to use therapeutic terms. Ochako does get stabbed here, and right before Toga could like out her whole love for Deku, Froppy steps in and reminds us all that this is not a romance shonen, this is a battle shonen. You gotta go do the battle shonen thing, Deku. This is not the time or place. Go, go, go fight. Now, Froppy does reassure Deku that you know, Ochako's the most experienced person here. We've taken so many measures to, you know, fight Toga, but, you know, we're also being told how dangerous Toga is for being unpredictable. So it's hard for me not to be pessimistic here, especially since, you know, again, Ochako just got stabbed. And also, I don't even think they know that Toga can, like, steal people's quirks now. Like, not steal, but just, like, she can copy people's whole quirks, not just how they look. So if they don't know that, this is gonna be a really tough fight, and I don't see anyone getting out from any of these fights unscathed anyway, but like the whole good luck sending Deku off, I we got this, is like, no, we know as the reader that he should not, he should not be leaving. I mean, he should be leaving to go fight the biggest threat, but he should probably stay a couple minutes. Either way, Deku takes the good luck and uh, he dips, and that's the end of the chapter. Now, again, I forgot that this was a battle shonen and not at all a romance manga. So if there is a clarification, clarification on their <laughs> their whole uh, love thing going on, then, you know, that'll probably happen in a time skip when we see them together with their family or something like that. Not, you know, in the middle of the final battle. As for what's gonna happen next chapter, now, I assume it's gonna start off with Deku still on his way and just trying to get in contact with people, trying to read other situations on his way to Shigaraki, but, Maybe, you know, that we take that time to just, you know, stop in real quick, get some more AFO trash talking, and then hopefully, hopefully, jump into Shoto versus Vises versus Dabi. Um, because I'm just really looking forward to how artists and even the, the fan-made color art is done on the uh, the double page spreads there. As for like this fight though, I, I don't know. I hope that Toga can be saved, not in the sense that she becomes an ally. Although <laughs> I did say that, um, the whole dead man's parade thing can be coming back but as an ally move rather than as you know again uh, helping the villains move maybe it just comes out this fight i'm really not too sure though but um i think i hope for ochako's sake that you know even if they do kill toga or like before they imprison her she's just like all right cool she's kind of like rehabilitated a little bit she's like i understand where you're coming from you've kind of saved me just because you know we do have deku out to kind of save shigaraki for this battle and we, you know, learned very recently that Oshako is trying to save Toga as well. So it kind of be, you know, a little sad for her character if, you know, she can't save the one person she set out to save right now. I'm pretty sure that Oshako's kind of like diagnosed Toga. Like, you know, she's fought her a couple of times. It feels like the person who has the most understanding of, of Oshako or, or of Toga, sorry, is uh, is Oshako because she's, she's kind of confident in herself here. And just to go a little bit on and a little, little bit into, you know, what I think we'll be talking about um, when it comes to, you know, getting into the mind of Toga, especially with these backstories. Maybe, you know, it's not something that Ochako is able to bring out, but we are able to see as readers through the backstory. And I think it's like Toga's whole twisted idea of what love is. You know, she thinks love is becoming another person, uh, which, you know, seems codependent or just like seems really kind of, you know, obviously unhealthy. Um, especially with hurting them, you know, <laughs> you know, people are into whatever the hell they're into, but you know, the way that Deku phrases it is like, I would never hurt the person that I love. And you know, Toga kind of wants that. But also we do have more of a backstory than Deku has. And you know, we don't have much of Toga's upbringing, but it seems like that's how she kind of conveys her love. So maybe, maybe we get kind of a, a compromise here. Uh, Toga also does mention that, you know, she is most satisfied being someone else. So you know, kind of sides with the former idea. And also just the, the idea that she can suppress her whole being. You know, I feel like that might be a metaphorical thing, you know, just like she's not really herself or, you know, she's had to hide herself for so long that, you know, it is just manifested in her being able to mask her actual physical presence. So, you know, and also it's her quirk to become other people. So you never know. 
I, I, do, I would like to know how quirks manifest anyway, because you know that they can be generational. So like if you have a fire user, marry a fire user, their, you know, their offspring is probably gonna be a fire user. I wonder if, you know, if it has to do anything with her, her parents or, you know, if quirks just manifest throughout things that you love as a kid. She needed to become other people. She could not be herself. So her quirk manifested as being other people. And just for the county argument, I know that she can be herself around the villains, but I don't think that's a real tight knit situation in the first place. And you know, I feel like the villains are just like, whatever weird you're trying to be, do it. But they're not like, you know, trying to dig deep into her head and be like, well, who are you really though? And I feel like that's what we're gonna get with this fight via hand-to-hand -hand combat. Maybe, you know, Froppy and Ochako are able to be like, yo, ain't many candidates for the kind of love you're looking for, but we can find it. You know, we, we can find a compromise here via, via, via that's the New York accent coming out, <laughs> via, uh, via like punches and stuff like that, or just like beating it into our head senselessly. Also a makeover montage. I can just see, you know, Froppy and Ochako going uh, uh, coat shopping with Toga towards the end of the series. Now on to Jujutsu Kaisen 178 and the uh, release of Rika. Now, as anyone who's you know ever seen or read uh, JJK Zero, then you would know that the fact that Rika even exists in the first place right now is kind of weird. Um, so luckily, the explanation for that this chapter. But yeah, you know, even you know some of the fan translations have been putting Rika in quotes, which you know has just made things also really super fishy because. Maybe that's just the translators just, you know, voicing their own opinion of like why they think it's weird. But, you know, even in the Viz translation today, we, we now know we no longer have quotes. But, you know, I don't think the Viz translation ever did have quotes. But at least in the fan translation, it was, you know, since since we got and got it explained, you know, the quotes went away, which is kind of cool. I like I like little little details like that when I can spot them because I'm really terrible at spotting details otherwise. One last thing before we like really start on talking about the chapter is I want to give Gage and his team all the props in the world because not only did the Japanese release of this movie get like chapter 168.1, which is like a nice little joke chapter or like, you know, a little gag chapter of, you know, what the crew was doing, um, I guess, you know, within the time, you know, with, within that time frame of, you know, zero before things popped off. But, you know, the American release also got a hand in hand reveal with Rika. So like it came out in North America on the same weekend that, you know, we really get Rika's presence revealed, which is, you know, amazing, absolutely amazing. So yeah, the chapter starts off with Udo and Ryu kind of astonished that Rika is here. And he, Udo even mentions like, oh, he hasn't been using his full power, which just tells us they're both about to get worked right now, which is awesome. Just as I was hoping we got a whole explanation of Rika this chapter, let me get into what I like and what I don't like, um, cause it's really small, but yeah, so, Rika Orimoto, the real Rika, um, passed on, but Rika, the cursed spirit, has become Yuta's cursed technique. And he can do about three things with it, which is he can fully manifest Rika. He can, you know, use Rika's like limitless cursed energy or store cursed energy in Rika, which is, might be a huge difference later on, but let me get to it. And then also you can store cursed techniques. So he pulls out a few and can't wait to talk about that. One second left, like I'm getting ahead of myself, but I like it because it feels a lot like, feels almost exactly like how Yuta's power worked in Zero anyway. And it just kind of reminds me of like Crollo Lucifer from, you know, Hunter x Hunter and any Hunter x Hunter reference in this manga series, I can, I, I'm perfectly fine with, but he's a little bit more better than than, than Crollo because Crollo can only use like one at a time. Now, before we get into the whole fighting thing, uh, let me just explain what I dislike or, you know, what I'm a little skeptical about when it comes to this whole Rika curse technique thing, which is, First of all, the five minute timer. I feel like that's only there so that Yuta just doesn't become the main character right now. And like, you know, you have to put some limitations on him to make sure that Yuji's still viable. Other people are still viable because the introduction that we got uh, during the Sendai Colony arc was just like, yeah, there's, there's only one person stronger than Yuta right now. And that is Gojo who's sealed up. I understand it at least, but it just makes me think of ways that Yuta could become ineffective later on, which brings me to the next point, which is the ring. Like what happens if the ring connecting him to Rika is destroyed by Kenjaku or just someone else? Does that mean he Yuta uses like all of his curse technique? Does that mean like he's significantly nerfed? Like, I, I wonder what that is. I worry for my boy Yuta, which is why I'm like, you know, even talking about it. But I just, I just hope that this is a way for a gauge to be like, 
No, we're just making him a little bit less powerful so that other characters can shine. Not because I'm setting him up for like a whole guild art scenario so that I can be like, he once was the most powerful, but here's why he's kind of just like, eh, like he's, he's just good enough to survive right now because, you know, the man, the man's going off right now. You can't just be like, yo, he's, he's this powerful. And then boom, right after we, you know, show just how great he is in the manga after all this time, you know, of him being away from the story, you're going to be like, oh, his ring got destroyed at this battle. Like he, his ring is gonna get destroyed and now he doesn't have Rika anymore. He just has a lot of cursed energy. That's like so whack. Especially since like you're going through so much trouble to keep Rika. Like there's a lot of explanation, well, not a lot, but like there's this explanation here to explain to the reader why Rika is still available or as like, you know, why, why st she's still able to be his cursed technique. So if we do all of that to make it logical and then just get rid of her anyway, it's like, damn, it's kind of, kind of worthless. Again, I hope it's just explained later as like a binding vow thing. Like, you know, the ring is there because that is that is the thing that's closest that connects them legit. So of course it's gonna be the thing that activates his curse technique. Cause like, again, we do get in the movie that like, you know, it doesn't have to just be the ring. He can manifest Rika through a sword, you know? So, you know, hopefully it's just the ring is there because that's what he prefers. Anyway, Yuta sends Rika at Udo and you know, we get this nice little zoomed in shot of Rika kind of blurred out with uh, Yuta behind her you know, simultaneously activating a cursed speech command to Udo, could like to like, stop her in place. So just goes to show maybe five minute limitation does not matter when you can use multiple cursed techniques at once. Now, before Yuta can completely take Udo out of the fight, Ryu chimes in because this is not a 1v2 scenario. This is a brawl, this is a whole free for all. And also because he's just a little bit jealous, you know, he's like, wow, this is a great power you got here. So I want I want a little piece of it. And so he launches a whole hair beam at Rika who deflects it before counter punching him. And then mid tumble, he counter punches her. It's like a really cool little scene. Yuta just keeps piling on the curse techniques this time with Shikigami. And before Udo can kind of realize, hey, he's sending out mini domains and this is Drov's technique. Drov, 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 Drov. That's what I'm saying. Anyway, by the time she realizes it, it's too late because Yuta's already in front of her, ready to let loose on her with another curse technique. Again, it's not enough to finish her off because before we do it, Ryu chimes in again right after Udo's whole mini rant and decides it's domain expansion time. And that's exactly where the chapter ends with all three of them activating domain expansions. Now we did get the explanation early on from Gojo that um, domain expansions, when it comes to multiple activations, the strongest one or like the most refined one will win and expand over the others. So part of me is fully expecting Yuta to just like clobber their whole thing. Like no matter what they do, his is the only one that manifests, but you know, you gotta, you gotta be able to see everyone. Cause at the end of the day, these are like two curse users who are still really talented. And you know, Udo has a, a, a curse technique or whatever that can control the air. So it's very possible that she can still activate her domain inside someone else's, but just like control the air. I'm assuming that like her domain expansion is like, uh, Caesar Clown's Gasu Gasu Fruit, where he can just like suck the oxygen out of the room. So, you know, maybe she has an avenue there. I think Ryu has the best chance of activating his though, because even though he doesn't have the most refined or, you know, most powerful domain expansion, he is introduced as the one with the greatest output or like a huge, you know, noticeable output of cursed energy. So I still expect him to be able to overtake it, if not temporarily. You know, when Yuta is like, Focusing on someone else, maybe that's the, the chance for the other person, the third person to activate part of their domain or just like activate the domain within it. Like I ex fully expect it to be like transferring between domains, which would be awesome. Now I still think Yuta and Rika's bond is gonna be enough to like kind of give them an easy win. So part of me, the fanboy in me is thinking like, he's only gonna let them release their domains because he wants to copy their whole techniques. So he needs to scope it out and see how, you know, kind of understand it. Also, you know, just for a story sense, you have to, have them inner monologuing or just like the, the opponent's outward monologue, like, hey, this is how my technique works. And he's like, all right, I scoped it out enough. Let me take that for myself. Or I don't think he can actually steal it. I think he just copies, right? So he's gonna kill them. But then since he knows how their technique works, he's gonna, you know, do it anyway. Someone said that uh, Yuta's uh, domain is a wedding ceremony between him and Rika. And I love that idea because if it's anything like, or if his domain expansion is anything like what we saw at the end of uh, Zero, then that means that he can like just release the limit on cursed energy output and it's just obliterating the entire surrounding area just like 
he can just obliterate the domain expansion with just sheer power alone, which is so fire. And, you know, it's already kind of an easy win for him. I already predicted that Yuta would be able to, like, put off, like, a 3v1 or 4v1 scenario. And he kind of is. Like, I know he got rid of Drove first, but that was a one-shot kill. Was, he, he immediately off Drove. And Kurorushi, Kuroshi, whatever the hell, only got hits in because he was, like, nerfing himself. Because he knew that he was being watched. And he's been able to handle, you know, this 2v1, or, I guess, 2v2 kind of uh, easily. So I, I still have no doubt in my mind to the power scaling community of Jujutsu Kaisen, if that even exists, that um, Yuta should be able to take on a 4v1. He should be able to Sendai, solo Sendai, <laughs> which he kind of already still is doing again. So I'm looking super forward to the climax of the skirmish here. I cannot wait. And, you know, let me just quickly give my thoughts on the Jujutsu Kaisen Zero movie. Oh, actually, before I start, we got some lore this chapter. I did not forget about that. I just forgot that I wrote about that. But um, Udo mentions, you know, the group affiliated with Tor, with, you know, the moon, sun, and stars, the sun, moon, and star squad, which is way easier to say in English because the Japanese one is a tongue twister. But yeah, she does mention them and how they're like a nameless thing, kind of like a, the Anbu from Naruto or just like, you know, any assassin squad, you know, with nameless ninjas and stuff like that. And how they kind of betrayed her. You know, used her as a scapegoat, some specific member used her as a scapegoat to cover up his own, you know, crime of like killing a fellow clan member. So it seems like this is Udo's second chance at, you know, making a name for herself. And Yuta can't relate because he's already made, made a name for himself, which is why he's like scolding her because he really can't relate. But I think that's it for her. I don't think we're going to get much more backstory for her because she's already stated like what she's fighting for in the first place. And you know, it makes more, we have enough to understand her. We're not gonna get any more from Ryu because we already understand like why he wants to fight in the first place. So we're good. All, all, the, all the things have taken place to prepare and like make this battle, you know, worthwhile for the reader to like care about, you know, not care about, but just like understand where the villains are coming from. So that's why we're moving into domain expansions because you know, all that, what's it called? Um, all that pretense has already been set up or whatever. Now, I think the whole tall thing doesn't mean anything to us right now, but this is like prep for another ancient sorcerer lord dump that we will be getting in the future. Like the whole sun, moon, and star squad thing is gonna be like a little bit more relevant later on when giving us full context of how things worked in the past. And the reason why we keep getting mentions of Tull, which, you know, again, means nothing to us right now, is so that when that name comes up later, we'll understand it or we'll understand why. Okay, so spoiler warning for JJK Zero. Even if you've read it, but haven't seen the movie yet. Um, you out? Okay, good, good. Now, probably my favorite part of the movie, of all the things, is the inclusion of the Kyoto class because we did know, you know, that Toto made a name for himself kind of um, in Kyoto. And, you know, we got to see that. The only nitpick I have of the whole movie is that, you know, we didn't get different character designs, but I feel like that means it might've been like a last minute decision from the studio to be like, yo, these characters are actually really popular in the anime. We got to include them in the movie. And it was like, all right, cool. So, you know, we got, it was pretty one-to-one -one, the whole movie in general, but you know, we just got more scenes. Like we got Gojo fighting Miguel, which, you know, was kind of off screen in the manga, understandably, because we didn't know much more about Gojo other than that, like, you know, he was a really powerful teacher, but you know, we really got to see the six eyes and stuff in action, which was awesome. And uh, we also got Nanami, like that was awesome. That was really great. because. It was another thing that was mentioned in the anime too. You know, Nanami mentions how, you know, he was able to do Black Flash four times in a row, but that's his that's his record. He, he got lucky too. And we get that exact fight. You know, we, we get to see him step up, you know, I guess against like a grade one or a special grade or whatever, and, you know, hit that Black Flash four times, which is awesome. I think that might've been my favorite part. Um, in the movie itself, I think my favorite part of the whole experience was the fact that when Toto pops on screen, <laughs> he got an applause from the theater. <laughs> my girl is next to me like, yo, why? Like, <laughs> she, he sucks. Like, he's the worst character. Why is he getting applause? But it's just like, he's hype. And, and the, the whole scene of just getting the whole Kyoto class in general is just like, again, it didn't happen in the manga because they didn't exist yet. So it was awesome. And speaking of Black Flash, we got Yuta's Black Flash, which is, you know, you can see that in this scene in the, in, in the panel, um, it's not included because of course it's not, it wasn't made yet. You know, the series hadn't really started yet. So the fact that they wanted to do that, just to add that, just to be like, just just show how much more powerful Yuta is than you understand. 
we gave him some black flash real quick just to just show that you know he's really skilled with this technique which was awesome you know i think anyone who's watching the movie who's like just even just watched the manga i mean sorry watched the anime just knew how powerful and intense that moment was like you can hear the gasps in the audience with every black flash and just the fact like you know even aside from the movie tying up even lo every loose end and just being like yo here's context for this scene here's context for that scene at the end you know you see gojo pop up in kenya with miguel and yuta and, and you know you know that based on you know the whole comment that he has and bringing yuji back to the crew that he's just like i was on vacation i had to go away on a business trip like you know everything is tied up aside from that even without that the movie just looked amazing you know the cgi on the on the cursed spirits was awesome every single shot especially the opening shot was just crispy and you know there was no there was no part in that movie that i really could nitpick other than like you know the character designs but like that's small that's not something that threw me out at all it was just like something i noticed so loved it absolutely loved it um i'm probably gonna go watch it again in the dub just so i can appreciate the animation a little bit more because you know reading subtitles is just like i had to like prop myself up during the movie to be like all right i have to make sure i get every single word because someone's head is in the way so i'm gonna go see it again um, with the dub just to make sure of that but yeah that's it for me this week um less pressure to get this thing out because one piece is on break so this will probably be out like around four or five maybe late night who knows but um i have a child of prophecy video thing coming out i still have to do a, a couple more edits to the script so i'm gonna try to record that tonight or tomorrow um and make sure i get that out by tuesday and then since platinum End is ending this week i'll you know i'll do the last video reaction with that on thursday and then also uh, release another video next week about Platinum End, just wrapping up, you know, a review of the whole series. Maybe another video after that to like, to just talk about Death Note. And then another video after that to talk about like, you know, the legacy of, of Oba and Obata, which, you know, I'm really looking forward to those two as well. All of the Platinum End stuff I'm looking forward to. So long as the series doesn't end trash. Either way, I'll still have fun trashing it anyway. So yeah, that's about it. I um, hope you all had a great weekend, enjoyed the weather out here in New York. It was really nice outside, so I opened up the window. Um, but yeah, appreciate you. Thank you for making it all the way through this. This is, a long, this is not too long to edit, but you know, I have a new editing process. So fingers crossed that this is a quick edit anyway. Either way, I'm Shonen. Uh, be safe.